morgen ind. Vi kommer ind anden. Good morning, and what a show we got lined up for you today. I'm excited about today. The very talented tenor Alfie Bo will be back. Yay! He's going to be taking in his chicken Kiev and a dish of mackerel and performing for us live a little bit later. Uh, Romy Gill will be back as well. Uh, she's bringing a recipe for sea bass with her, and I'll be serving up buttermilk chicken on the banks of the beautiful River Test. Alicia Vasey, yes, Yay! Alicia will be back. She's giving us more advice on food you can go out and forage for this weekend. And I'll be showing you how to make the perfect, the classic, the best dessert in the business, apart from a lemon tart, but probably right up there, the classic tart stand in this week's Little Masterclass. But first, my guest this morning in the kitchen is a great chef and an even greater mate of mine. He's my double act, my <laughs> sidekick from Mawson Hall in Norfolk. It's the brilliant Gordon Blackiston! Yeah. Oh. Thank Good you, to have sir. you back, Sheffy. Uh, what is, I mean, business is going great for you as well, the fish and chip shop and everything yeah. else. Yeah. What are you going to be cooking for us then? Because we, <laughs> so we have a team of food people on the show, home economists and everything else, that get the food ready. We have no idea, even <laughs> now, before we even... Now, we're sure. just about to start the show, what you're going to be I'm doing. If sure. you don't know what you're going to be doing. I think I'm going to do... It's, it's, it's actually served at Morstan, and I call right. it the burnt offering. <laughs> The burnt offering, right? Yeah, because it's like a batter, but it's black. Right. And inside it is some lovely halibut. What makes it black? The squid ink or what? No, charcoal powder. Right. It doesn't taste of old coal or anything. <laughs> right. But it's all right. It's going to be quite nice, I think. And there's not a lot that can go wrong. Yeah, wait so... and see for that one. But anyway, <laughs> right, we're kicking things off today uh, by putting this year's harvest to good use. I'm going to show you a simple little recipe for a simple apple cake. And uh, we're going to introduce you to an amazing supplier of these amazing apples in a minute. But the first thing, for a standard cake recipe, we've got some butter, we've got some sugar, I've got some flour, I've got some eggs. And all I'm going to do, first of all, is just cream the butter and the sugar together. So, like a classic sort of cake. I always call this way of making a cake not sponge. Yeah. Because a sponge, I use eggs and sugar and whip it all up. But for this one, we take the sugar and the butter, mix it together, add the eggs, then add the flour, and that's it. So the difference between a cake and a sponge is one's with lots of butter, one's with no butter, really, apart from a genuine sponge, which has got a little bit of melted butter in there as well. But we're just going to mix this all together. While that's happening, we're going to head to Macclesfield. Yes, Macclesfield, we're not going to go to Kent for this one. <laughs> we're going to go to Mac or Norfolk. Macclesfield, speak to Sarah Simpson from the Random Apple Company. Uh, morning to you, Sarah. Good morning, how are you doing? It's great to hear from you as well. Now, before we get on to the apples, tell us about this business, this Random Apple Company, and how it all started. Were you always involved in that? Because you're, you're known locally as the, the crazy apple lady, which I absolutely <laughs> love. I never knew anybody that yeah. was obsessed with apples more than you. You've taken well, thank that Thank you title. very much indeed. Yeah, so, it's, it's a weird obsession to have. Um... So tell us where it all started from then. So I actually used to work in the sportswear industry um, and um, I, I think I just reached my limit and um, started going back to doing some foraging, which I loved doing as a kid. Um, and then started to realise how great apple trees are, how many people have got one in their garden, um, but how many are going to waste because people get to their limit of making apple crumbles, apple pies, filling their freezer, and then they get to the following year and they've still got stuff in their freezer. Um, so alongside planting up um, what's now an orchard of about 400 trees um, at Random Apple HQ, as I call it, um, I started inviting people to bring their apples to my little apple pressing room called the Applery um, and started to swap, swap their apples for some, some juice. So they were making use of them um, and getting something for nothing. Effectively. How long ago was this? Uh, so this was back in 2014. Wow. Um, you'd giggle because I must have looked like a state. I used to go around flyering people. I was heavily pregnant at the time, and um, my daughter ended up being born on National Apple Day, would you believe, uh, <laughs> mid-October. So the first year was a bit chaotic, to say the least. <laughs> so so, so t t now you've got, what, 450 different varieties of apples growing? Um, so I've got about 400 trees, and within that, there's about 60 different varieties. So people, in, people, are, you, you only, this is your business. You've, yeah. you've got a 10-mile radius around Macclesfield. The whole yeah. idea of this is people who produce apples and, and haven't got the ability to press them and bits and pieces can come to you, yeah. get them pressed. And you started producing just a... What was it, just a couple of litres in a small press? Now you're about to get a massive press. Yes, yeah. 
So um, I started off with the smallest little hand press you can get um, and then had to upscale to um, a hydraulic press, which is a lot easier on the arms, shall we say. It's still fairly fairly hard, hard going, but yeah, a lot easier on the arms. Well, we're about to taste the fruits of your hard labour because this is the apple juice. This, this is the best apple juice I've ever tasted. <laughs> Thank honestly, you. honestly, <laughs> how good is that? Yeah, so good. Thank you. So what's this one? So that, that was probably an early season from last year. Um, the early season tends to, um, because of the variety of apples that come in, um, sort of a, a more lemony colour and slightly more clear. And then as you get later in the season, it tends to get cloudier. Um, because of the different varieties. I'm realised I'm going to upset the people from Somerset and Kent and Sussex for all this sort of stuff, yeah. but, th I mean, this is... I mean, <laughs> the flavour of this, it's sharp, it's sweet, it's it's beautiful. It's delicious. So I've used some of these apples to go in my little apple apple cake, which I'm doing over here, but I wanted to just just turn our attention to this this apple you've sent, the one in the middle. Tell us about this special one that you've got on here, this, this, the red one that we've got. That I'm going to cut through the middle, I'm going to use this to garnish my little cake, but tell us about this then. That just wait till you see this when you cut it in the middle. I've never seen anything like this. Oh my god! If I have to be forced to pick my all-time favourite apple, that is probably it. Um, purely because of the absolute childish joy it gives me with that colour. Well, everybody's gone wow here with it as well. But wh where does this come from? Where? where what? Where? Isn't what? That how? Why? Absolutely hmm. beautiful. Yeah. So um, those were planted because of their amazing colour and rather excitingly, and this, again, gives me absolute childish excitement every year, uh, when I've got a decent quantity of those um, and you press them, it presses bright pink apple juice. Um, the pink colour obviously doesn't taste, last taste that one. hugely long, but I have sent you a bottle of last year's um, rosette apple juice. So you've got a slightly pink one there. Um, it's a lot sweeter, so I tend to try and balance it out with other varieties as well, because otherwise you get really sickly sweet juice. And this is so natural. You don't have to. You don't have to put any. There's no preservatives in this. There's just to keep it. It's just. There's a tiny, tiny amount of vitamin C because otherwise it would oxidise straight out and start to go brown. Um, but other than that, no. There's nothing. It's just apples in there. I don't add sugar. I just use natural sweetness to balance out the flavour. So what, can, can people? Produce that at home. How, how are you going to get? Absolutely. How do you get? How do I go there? If I want to produce this apple uh, in my garden, what do I do? Um, so I tend to use a variety of different nurseries to source all my apple trees from. There's some great ones online if you don't have a local apple tree nursery. Um, and rosette apple seems to grow even in my northerly part of the country. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I've got um, an awful lot of people around me that, because of the apple juice I've been producing, um, have wanted to plant more trees at home. So a lot of people have put in rosette, particularly because they love the colour of it and they know it's growing well for me, so they're giving it a go. And I know Galton's interested to know where Macclesfield is, so give him a little bit of geography lesson, cos he doesn't know. Near Derbyshire. It, well, it's, it's Cheshire. We're on the border, basically, nearly on the border, so kind of on the edge of the Peak District. And um, just to relate it back to apples, I've got a really sad apple -y fact here, which I always giggle about. Um, apples apparently started um, in Kazakhstan. That's where the apple was born. Um, and the view is that it kind of moved along the Silk Road um, with sort of travelling traders and things like that and eventually became the sort of the cultivars that we see today. Uh, Macclesfield is actually uh, the UNESCO World Heritage Site other end of the Silk Road. Um, so it's kind of like the end of the apple story in some ways, or should I say the beginning? <laughs> I never, you see, I knew somebody was into apples more than Raymond Blanc, and it's you. <laughs> it's definitely, definitely you as yeah, well. Yeah, no, I, I'm always learning and absolutely obsessed. <laughs> so I, I know you, you, and you're passing that obsession. As I'm just going to finish off the cake now, because it's, it's been fascinating talking to you, but I've got this wonderful little cake with the grated apples in there as well. I'm going to finish it off with this glaze made out of your lovely apple juice as well. But we're going to take some whipped cream and I'm then just going to put that into the cake as well. But I know you do little talks and, and lectures for, for people if they want to, but also for, for kids. You're doing... You put so much good back into the... The, the, the local community. Tell us about that so then kids can come and visit and you go around to the schools and teach people about it. It's fasc fascinating. 
Yeah, so I mean, um, pre COVID, I was doing an awful lot of school visits throughout apple season, and they could come and they could pick the apples. Um, and then they could come into the press room and see how what's actually been picked off the tree could be turned into juice and then try the juice fresh off the press. Um, still doing a little bit of that. But the, the biggest thing now is actually I've started doing some planting projects um, with local schools. Um, there's a school locally that has a new site. Um, that I'm doing a 15 year project with. So every single new starter into reception gets a unique variety apple tree, just like they're unique as a child. Um, and they get to help plant it and then watch it grow as they grow and sort of as they grow up through the school. Um, and every single variety that is going into that school is completely different. So hopefully it will end up the one of the biggest single variety um, orchards in, in the Northwest, which will be fantastic. But okay. from a habitat point of view, it's amazing. From an educational point of view, it's amazing. Um, and I just, I can't, can't wait to see it kind of start to grow in tree like the size of the trees well the people of Macclesfield are very very lucky to have you on your doorstep just just I know you're only you're you're very very small but just tell everybody you, you're producing how many bottles a year this is just from you and the people who that just drop the apples in how many bottles are you personally doing are you, this is this is that are you doing so last year was an absolute crazy season it was a bumper crop I've never seen anything like it I did over 10,000 bottles of apple juice last year which for the big commercial producers they'll laugh at that because they pretty much do that in a day um but on the press I'm using that for me was a very proud moment last year to realize exactly how much we'd managed to get through um an, an average season for me is less than half that Sarah, it's been a pleasure talking to you as well. Hopefully, I've done it just as well. And it just goes to prove golden. We never stop learning in this business. Oh, crikey. Do we? But I, I wish you all the very best. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you ever so much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Say hi to Macclesfield for me. I will do. Thank you very now much. Now he knows where it is. Yeah. <laughs> I knew where it was. Thank you. <laughs> but there you have it, my lovely little apple uh, and apple juice cake using these amazing variety of apples that I've never heard of until today. Done. Brilliant. <laughs> Little slice, Chief. Yes, please. Little slice. You do make it look so easy. Well, actually, uh, I, I do like desserts. You know, I'm, I'm doing this. I'm doing this lovely tart tan later on, which is one of my favourite favourite desserts, and I know that you love it as well. But I mean, uh, there's a lot more t in common between us two than you actually think. Worryingly enough, yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <God>. <laughs> look at that. <laughs> Right, Galton will be firing up the stoves a little bit later. Do you know what you're doing again? Uh, t t burnt offering. That's what he's doing, yeah, tuning for that one. <laughs> and uh, singing superstar Alfie Bow will be here very shortly. But don't go anywhere. After the break, uh, we've got the recipe that we're perfect to enjoy in tonight's Rugby World Cup final. See you later. That's so nice. Can you put that on camera? He didn't often say that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Welcome back. Now we're showing you how to make a classic tart tan, one of the world's greatest desserts in this week's Little Masks Class. And top tenner Alfie Bo will be joining us in the kitchen very shortly. OK, it's time for more cooking now. And this week, we're dipping into the archives and serving up a recipe for buttermilk chicken that's perfect to enjoy in front of the telly when you're enjoying the Rugby World Cup final on ITV1 tonight. I'll be watching it. Enjoy this one. Now, this is a great dish for a picnic, really, because you can prepare this in advance and take it with you and have it cold. But it's fried buttermilk chicken with a chipotle mayonnaise. Really simple to prepare. But what you do need to do is you need to marinate the chicken beforehand for at least 12 hours, ideally 24 hours. And I've got some chicken thighs, which I think are the best to do this, rather than chicken breasts. You can use chicken breasts, but chicken thighs are perfect. And what you want to do is get the boned out chicken thighs, or take the bone out of the chicken thighs, and use the thighs rather than the legs, really, because you get a much nicer piece of meat. But that's what you end up with 
once they've been in that buttermilk. And it is just plain buttermilk, no salt, no pepper. Just mix the two together and just leave them covered overnight in the fridge. And then we start with our spices. And our spices, we start off with some plain flour. And this is where a recipe can vary massively. I've got garlic salt, I've got a bit of thyme, some celery salt. Over here, I've got a little bit of allspice, some oregano, a nice little bit of cayenne pepper, and then a touch of cinnamon or nutmeg. It's entirely up to you, but usually it's got the garlic salt and onion salt in there. You can load this up as much or as little as you want, really, but they're always the dried thyme and dried herbs. So oregano is a definite must. A little bit of the old onion salt. And then go easy with the old allspice, that kind of stuff, maybe a little bit less. And then you can have as much or a little cayenne as you want. And then I've got in here a little bit of nutmeg. You can use cinnamon. So you're building up a selection of spice, that and a good pinch of salt. What you want to do is mix this together so all the spices combined and the dried herbs. Give it a good mix in. And then all I've done is got a pan on here with some oil in. So deep fat frying at home, about 170, 160, 170. The key to this is make sure it's not too hot because you don't want the outside to brown and the inside not to be cooked, otherwise you've got to flash it through the oven. So just drop the temperature of the fryer down and then you can take your chicken thighs and pop them in this combination of spice and flour. You just drop them in, roll them around like that, make sure they're nicely coated, and then all we do is just drop them in the hot oil. Now be very, very careful when you pop them in. You do this in a deep fat fry at home, don't do it in a pan like what I've got here. But funnily enough, I've got no electric by the riverbank. Carefully pop them in. And do these in batches, four at a time. And these will cook for about four to five minutes. So when you're happy with them nicely coloured and nicely cooked, usually take between sort of six and eight minutes, you can lift these out. Look at those. Decent sized chunks. You can cut these into smaller pieces if you want, but they look pretty good to me. And by doing this in batches, you keep the temperature of the oil. So just allow the oil to heat up while we take more of our chicken out like that into the crumb and then into the hot oil. You can also do this with fish if you want, but I wouldn't leave it in the buttermilk for overnight, just a few hours. Stuff like prawns you can do this with as well. And salmon, look at that. Put that in there. While the last batch is cooking away nicely, we can concentrate on our dressing. And our dressing is really simple. It comes in the form of a nice little mayonnaise. And I'm going to flavour that with wonderful chipotle chilli, those lovely smoked hot chilies. So usual classic mayonnaise. You can make this with whole eggs or egg yolks. It's entirely up to you, or a combination of both. But starting off with an egg yolk. Probably about three, I think, will be good for this. 
crack them in there. And I always start off, whatever I'm going to flavour my mayonnaise with is a good dollop of mustard, Dijon mustard for this. A nice, good dollop of it. That helps get you started in terms of emulsifying everything together. And then using a whisk, you can do this in a machine with a whisk. We just whisk it together. And then with the mayonnaise, what you need to do is gradually, gradually pour in the oil. And this takes a good five minutes to mix in. So slowly, add a little oil at a time, just keep whisking. see is the more oil you put in the thicker it gets the most important bit is don't stop whisking while you're adding the oil it's a lot easier in a machine to be honest so you see at the end of it what you end up with a simple little mayonnaise and then this is where you can flavor it with whatever you want. A little bit of lemon, a touch of crab, some herbs, it's entirely up to you. A bit of grain mustard. And you use this as a lovely little base, a nice little dipping sauce. But for this one, I'm gonna use this chipotle chilies, these wonderful smoked chilies. And you see straight away what happens. The minute you add this paste to this, it turns this beautiful color, this orangey color. And that is the perfect accompaniment with this chicken. So then all you need to do is just put a little bit of salt and pepper, seasoning, and that's your simple dressing done. You can have that as a nice little dip if you wanted to cut these pieces of chicken slightly smaller. But that's perfect. And then we'll just take off and remove our final bits of the chicken. Lift these out. Then all we can do now is just plate it up or board it up, which is what I'm going to do. Pop this all on. This tastes delicious. All on here. Mm. I can't resist. A few bits of that. Mm. And then, just to finish this off, all I'm going to do is just take our nice little sauce, just kind of dollop it on, really. A bit of that. We've got some mint and coriander. Touch of mint. Great combination, mint and coriander, even with chicken. The mint. But a little bit of that. And now I've got some lovely fresh green chilies. Plenty of those over the top. So there we have it. Buttermilk fried chicken with a chipotle mayonnaise, green chili, mint and coriander. Don't forget the scraps. They're the best bit. Alton Blackiston will be cooking for us very shortly, and top forager Alicia Vasey will be here and dropping by the house a little bit later. But I'll see you back here in a few minutes when I'll be serving up a mackerel dish for my guest, Alfie Bow. See you in a bit.
Welcome back. Now, Chef Romy Gill will be sharing her recipe for sea bass, and the UK's number one forager, Alicia Vasey, will be dropping by the house a little bit later on this morning. But first, I'm here with one of the country's finest tenors whose voice has wowed audiences everywhere from the West End stage to Vegas to my house several times. It's a great <laughs> friend of mine, a great friend of the show. It's Alfie Bow! <laughs> Pleasure having you it's back. It's a Ching. pleasure to be pleasure. here. Pleasure. Ching, ching, Thank ching. You. Great Cheers. to see you as well. Thank you. Yeah, it's a lot, a lot of fun being now, here. Now, you've been busy. You've just finished a tour, so mm. you're very, very hungry. I know you love your Starving. food. We've got chicken here for you later as well. But I'm going to do this wonderful little bit of mackerel. So I'm going to do that with a nice little homemade chutney. Mm. So just running through the chutney ingredients, really, well, before we talk about yourself, we've got some apples, we've got some pears, I've got some ginger, garlic, star anise, a little bit of shallot. I've got two different types of spices, a little bit of paprika or a little bit of chilli, and then I've got some cumin, some brown sugar, two types of vinegar, sherry vinegar and white wine vinegar, yeah. and then some tomatoes. And all I'm going to do is grate, really, the apple and the pear, and that makes our lovely little chutney with our tomatoes that we're going in there. So okay. we've got a little bowl over here. So we're just going to grate those over a bowl, because I don't really want... I can utilise a little bit of the juice, but uh, the idea is we're just going to just grate all this up so it's much, much quicker right. to cook, because this chutney is going to take really, really quick to cook. T tell me about tell me about the album then, because the album you've, you've done fifteen odd albums now, haven't you? Something like that, yeah. yeah. Unbelievable. I mean, I've, I, this this idea for this album I had probably twenty years ago, and it was my chance to try and give an example of of, of the, how small this musical world is, how close the connections are between different genres. So I. I am a big fan of rock music, big fan of classic rock music, but I'm also trained as an opera singer, so I love classical music as well. Um, and so I created this album with that in mind. So I sing the songs in my own way, with my own voice, that sort of thing, and but my own approach. Yeah. But I add a full symphony orchestra to it and my rhythm band as well. Of course you do. There you go. <laughs> and, and I'm assuming when you're doing stuff like that, because, I, I, I mean, the track list of your album as well, yeah. we're both of a similar age. Yeah. yeah. 50. 50. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we're both of a similar... You, when you look at the track list, it is like a... A, a track list that I would put together. You've got Brian Adams from yeah. '69. That, yeah. There must have been some tracks on there for you, as although you say the genre is similar, yeah. there must have been some things you've gone. We'll try that and and try it and try it and try it, and you just got no. no this exactly. Work. There was one. There was one song that I, I thought this is going to be perfect. It's a wonderful song. And it was by Motley Crue. It was called by Motley Crue. <laughs> Motley Crue, and it was called Home Sweet Home. Right. And it has that big old anthemic chorus in it. Yeah. But the rest of the song is quite monotonous. Right. <laughs> so, you know, and I tried to sing it and I thought, no, this is just not working. But there must be some songs that you look at and you, that doesn't work, not just lyrically as well, but pace-wise and with an orchestra and you just don't... That yeah. doesn't suit your voice. Yeah, there must exactly. be something you just go, no, yeah. that's not, that's not going to work at all. It is important to choose the right songs. And I think for this particular album, we got every single one right. We did take some chances, obviously, we like Brian Adams' Summer of 69. Yeah. Um, but it came across really well, and I think every track on the album um, comes across pretty well. Because he's doing something different all the time. You almost, it seems to be with you, you sort of, you, you reinvent yourself all the time. You know, yeah. I remember going to see you at the Albert Hall, <laughs> then you burst into this rock track, and you could almost, we were at the side, and we were looking around going, people thinking, what on earth is he doing? But then you nail it with it with the, with the, I mean, <laughs> the noise is just, Thank how you. do you do that? <laughs> because, you know, you, you, you you come from a you come from a big family musical yeah, yeah, family yeah nine nine, nine of you nine kids yeah nine of us yeah so I had to shout a lot to be heard so that was <laughs> <laughs> how, but how how did you know when you were doing that I know there's an amazing story that I know you we both love our cars yeah, so yeah you ended yeah. up working for a TVR TVR yeah, you were right, wasn't yeah. that was the moment where you got spotted? I was singing around the factory and love this. you know there was a customer buying a um, it was a Griffith and he overheard me singing along to the radio and. And said to me, literally, he said, you've got a really good voice. Um, why don't you do something with it? You, you shouldn't be here. You should be. There's a company in London that are auditioning for singers for their next UK tour. What were you, what were you doing? Um, I was the. I was at the end of the line, so I was like, uh, sort of like inspecting the car for any, any sort of scratch, any sort of, sort of din. Any. You, well, you know, were the. You were the awkward one, putting rings around it and sending it back <laughs> to the beginning. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I started off as a Matt Blacker. Right. So I used to sort of like spray the underside of wheel arches and things like that. But right. Um, um, but then yeah, I was finishing there, and, and he's just said to me, "Take a day off work, go down to London, love it, sing for this company, and see if they'll take you on." And they did. 
and uh, and I never looked back. That was well, you say you never looked back because you know you ended up. This is the amazing thing. It links us into the book as well. Yeah. Because last time you were here, we get onto writing of its pieces. Yeah. This is this is in your book. It's a fascinating read as well. Thank you. I, yeah. And I've known you for a long time. I never knew about this this sleeping on a park bench story. Oh, yeah. The sleeping bag. I mean, yeah. you had you had nothing when you were. The, what was the college of music? Royal College of Music. Yeah. T tell us yeah. about the story yeah, was, with that. It was my second year of of college where. Um, uh, I was living with three other guys, three other musicians, and we were... Our, our apartment was just terrible. Our flat was awful. But anyway, we, um, we got kicked out of our apartment because the, the drains flooded. And um, we all went to the pub for the day. And at the end of the night, when the pub was closing, everybody went to their girlfriends or their parents' houses. And my parents were in the north of England. And I thought, yeah. where do I go? So I just thought, I'm just going to kip down here. It was middle of the summer, and I led down on a park bench with my sleeping bag and stayed there for a few weeks, pretty much. And so then, you were waking yeah. up in the morning and then going to the going college to, music? Going to college, studying during the day, showering at college, eating at college, and then going and sleeping in the, in the parks, <laughs> that sort of thing. But I, just, I didn't want to give up, you know? I, didn't, I wanted to really see London through. I wanted to see my college work through and survive, in a way. I didn't want to have to return home. And you asked for amazing... I'm amazing. The, the, people say it's luck in this business. There's no luck with it, I think. You've got to be the uh, right place at the right time. Yeah. But is that luck? I, no, well, you've got to do all the work, but you... You, had, you know, Baz Luhrmann? Well, Tell yeah, everybody Baz, about the Baz Luhrmann story. I was so. working at the Royal Opera House uh, as an opera singer there, doing a few productions. But I got an opportunity to, to take the afternoon off from the show that I was in rehearsing for to run over Waterloo Bridge and sing to Baz Luhrmann in this studio. Love this. And, you know, obviously the big movie director, Moulin Rouge, Romeo and Juliet, all that sort of stuff. And he was putting on a production of La Boheme, Puccini's La Boheme. Right. And he was looking for three main tenors, three casts, to, to do the show. And um, he asked me to be one of them. So I uh, went to New York, sang to him again. He offered me the job. We, I moved to America. <laughs> And loved every single minute, man. Every single minute. It was a dream come true. I mean, all this is in the book and more as well, the pieces. But this is your little... So which I've seen you've got one eye on that. See, you're a big foodie. So all it, I've man. done is just charge a little bread. You can see I've got my nice little bit of chutney over here. And that's your little <laughs> chutney done, really. It's, I mean, it's so, so simple. I used to... <clears throat> I grew up eating um, mackerel, smoked mackerel every single day for breakfast. Yeah. So, because we never, you know, we didn't get kippers, but coming from Fleetwood in Lancashire, it was like, we had the smokers, the you mackerel. You had the smoke. smokers. Yeah. Well, this is, I mean, this is a, just a, a, a fun way to do it, really. I'm going to be cooking on this as well with a little bit of fish with Alicia's dish, but that goes to one side. We'll put that to one side. But this is the fish, and I learnt this out in, in Spain. They take one part vinegar, five parts oil, and you spray it on the fish, yeah, like that. Spray it both sides and just salt. Wow. No black pepper and you just cook it over the coals, wow. like that. So I'm assuming you, I mean, your diary must never stop. I'm assuming you've got plans for touring for next year and stuff like that and around the, around the globe. Yeah, it's getting busier, but you know, I, I do find it these days important to take some time out. I, I, I would like to, I haven't had a holiday in like eight years or six years. Really? Like yeah, so I need to. I would like to try all, and get away. But of all the places where you've been, because you've been to an amazing... I know uh, last time you were here, I think you were off to Japan. Yeah, I yeah. think. I mean, a place where I've never been as well. It must be fantastic Japan to go to Japan. Japan's gorgeous, man. Yeah, Tokyo, Osaka, Kyoto, it's beautiful places. Is, where them. would you go back in the world, then, if, if anywhere... Because you've been all over the place, where would you go back to? I, I would, you know, of all the places I've sung, I think that, that inspires me with music and food and the culture and the people, I'd say Italy. Italy? Italy, yeah. You know, I think, you know, with the amount of, you know, the amount of classical music that's there, cultural music, folk music, the food as well, you know, it just just makes you feel healthy. <laughs> it makes yeah. you feel good. No, you're it? exactly right, that. And so, I mean, Spain changed my, changed yeah. my view on But it's those Mediterranean well. countries, I think, that, that just have it. Exactly. Well, you're going to stick around for the rest of the morning as well. We're going to listen Thank to you as well at the end of all this. You'll be singing for us. But they have your little bit of chutney. You see how easy that was? Wow. To cook. I'm conscious that I don't put the star anise in there to sort of destroy your throat, which then means you can't perform for the rest of your life. So be cool. I think I've got it. Yeah, I've, I've picked it out there. It's, it's, it's out. But you just take a little bit of that. Thank you. A touch of the slices of bread, and there you have it. A simple little grilled mackerel with a homemade chutney and a little bit of sourdough toast. Done. Gorgeous, yes. <laughs> Thank you.
Right, that's for you, oh, Chief. Oh, man, thank you. It's a pleasure cooking for you every time. Oh, so bless tell you. me what you think of that, that the oh, mackerel man. with a chutney and a dive into that one. Oh, that's Ralph playing in the garden. Is that...? It, at this time of year, he ch just chases pigeons. Just, mm. just chases pigeons. Oh, my goodness, man, that's... That's incredible, that chutney. So simple, isn't it? So, so quick. I can taste that that vinegar spray on it. A little bit on there, but the chutney's so light, so easy. It's really nice. There you go. It's good start. There we go. Thank you so much. That's all right. We're going to stick around. We'll chat a bit later as well. There we go. I'll be making chicken chairs for Alfie later on in the show. And Romy Gill will be firing up the stoves very shortly. But join us again after the break. When Yes is here, Galton Blackiston will be whipping up one of his trademark recipes. There we go. Can you eat all this? You can eat all of it. Thank you. See you in a bit. Welcome back. Now, I'm making a summer vegetable tart in this week's Little Mask Class, and Lizzie Vasey will be here with the best of the season's foraging finds for us very shortly. But first, I'm joined by Romy Gill, and we're about to enjoy a fish dish from a chef who's been serving up classical French cuisine. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. From his North Norfolk coast for more than 20 years. It's the brilliant Galton Blackiston. Oh, thank you. Yay! Thank you, thank you. I said it's 30 odd years, though. 32 eh? years. You're supposed to say straight away you don't look old enough. Well, 32 years. And, uh, yeah, congratulations on it. Michelin star for how long? 24. Wow. 24 yeah. years as well. Right. So what are we going to be doing? Right. Then? So we're doing what a course that we sometimes put on at Mawson called the Burnt Offering. <laughs> Which is technically <laughs> fish and chips. It is technically fish and chips, maybe. But the fact that I'm using charcoal powder, I'm using this beautiful chicken halibut, or small halibut. Yeah. Um, and I'm making a, I'm making a batter using self-raising flour, gluten-free. Yeah. I think you nicked this from me. No, well, I do mine with cider. You do it with sparkling water, don't you? Yeah. So... Yeah. And this, charcoal powder. So, technically, I nicked it from, from uh, uh, Nathan Outlaw, and then you nicked it from me. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, you anyway. use charcoal powder. Charcoal powder, so you make a batter. Yeah. I have to concentrate because you mess me about sometimes. I was talking about French cooking, because you're, oh, yeah. you're now officially in the Good Food Guide, top ten best restaurants to eat French food. I didn't yeah. know you did French food. Neither did I. Right. <laughs> you are, you're right Neither up there with I. Claude Bossy and everybody yeah. else. Yeah, the Waterside Inn. Right. We're all in the top ten. I should think I scraped in, but... Um, I'll take it. But you have got a fish and chip shop. I have got a fish and chip shop, yeah. which I absolutely love it. And uh, I'm really proud of the fact that we've, we're doing all right. You know, there are tough times out there. <laughs> I'm just going to portion this up just so you see. <laughs> well, like that. So why charcoal? Because I, <laughs> it's just different. And there is a slight smoky flavour to it, right? But not a lot. And I just like the idea of it. It's just something a little bit different. And uh, when it comes out to the table, it looks like this black lump of coal. Lovely. But when you <laughs> break into <laughs> it... <laughs> when you break into it, you get this lovely, beautiful white flesh of halibut. And it's just a different sight thing. You know, you eat with your eyes, don't you? Yeah. First. So, did you want me to, so you want me to do the tartar I sauce? I want you to make a tartar sauce. Now, I would... If you go by my recipe... Yeah. It's a whole leg. So you're not? No. I do my Whole work. leg makes I, it I really use, nice and light. I use egg There's yolks. There's a method in my madness. I use egg yolks, touch of mustard. Yeah. And then vinegar. Blend, blend, and lemon vinegar, juice. And then lemon juice and a bit of uh, normal veg oil. Yeah. That goes okay. in there as well. Yeah, well, that's classical. All right. But I like it a little bit lighter. Do you know I, what I, mean? I do love the fact that you're putting chilies and, and other ingredients in it as well, isn't it? A little bit of lime. So you'll get some nice flavours to Different flavours going through there. Yeah. And do you, coriander. Do you serve that in your fish and chips? I serve it in at Morston. Ah. Fish and chips would be slightly different because you need a special pan just for the gluten-free okay. side of things. So. And if people don't like coriander, they can add something else? Of course you can, yeah. yeah. You can do it, yeah. To be, to be honest, up until about half an hour ago, this recipe didn't have coriander in it. <laughs> it's just, just completely making it up I as quite we go. like it, though. <laughs> eh? I do quite like I, it, though. Maybe... This is... I think it does give you a nicer flavour with fish, isn't it? With Indian I'm doing food. what you do, roughly chopped. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So if people want to make that at home, so where will they get their uh, charcoal from? 
The charcoal powder? Yeah. Great question. Turn no. <laughs> if people want to make it at home, forget the charcoal powder, okay. make a normal batter, or even use squid ink. Anyway, how's your chips? All right, they're fine. Another, another minute or so. Cool. Right. Then I want to fry these. So we got... Right. Lemon. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Touch your and lemon you, juice. Then you want to chop your herbs. Yeah, I'm going to do that. A little you bit of vinegar. Do you want me to do it, or well. do you want to do it? OK. That gets right. blended. So this is now ready to fry. All right, okay. well, I'll let you do the do the chips then. You can take yeah. the chips out. Have you blanched them first? No, I've just thrown them straight in. It's fine. Need a little bit longer. Yeah. They're right, aren't they? Yeah. Good. They're all right. There you go. They're all that right. That goes in there. Yeah. So Morstan celebrating 32 years. Yeah. Good food guy for a French restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> Twenty odd years as Michelin star. What's next for you then? What what's I don't know. It just, is. just to survive, what well, you know, there's no doubt about it. Everyone you speak to, I speak to, it's it's a tough time. It is. It really is. Um, I've never known anything quite, you know, it, all the utilities have gone up so much. Um, staffing problems. Mm -hmm. Charcoal's gone up. Charcoal's gone up. Price of charcoal's <laughs> gone up. And you might open Hurry a, up in there. You might open a French restaurant. <laughs> right, so we're there. Yeah. You happy with these chips? They look good. Yeah, no, perfect. Um, but I do think, I suppose, going back onto the Frenchness, um, I remember doing a, um, a programme with you and the late, great Michel Roux Senior. Yeah. And I decided I was going to do a Beurre Blanc, not knowing that he's just bought a book out on sauces. <laughs> but actually, he was very, very, very... Um, he was lovely about it. He said that is one of the best um, Beurre Blancs he's tasted. You won't remember that. Yeah, but you forget to say, he said, today. <laughs> right? It was, it was. Now, so this just goes in... Like this. Right. Into hot oil. Into hot oil. I can't wait to see how it's going. Yeah, I can't wait to see I can't wait well. either. <laughs> just remember that, that I did the chips and I did the tartar sauce. The <laughs> only thing that he's done is the fish. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> right, a little bit of soap. A little bit of chopped shallots in yes, your... Yes, please. Definitely finely chopped shallots. Mint. I like mint. That's controversial. But mint is my favourite herb at the moment. I okay. go through phases. I put mint in everything. OK. Love it. A uh, little bit of mint in the tartar sauce with the... With oh, the... look. They see, this is coming out all right. All right. <laughs> you can see how I get the burnt offering bit. Yeah. Uh, so we got the mint. This is quite got, good. You put a little bit of tarragon. Yes, tarragon, chives. chives, parsley, mint. Right, OK. Gherkin, uh, cornichons, baby capers. OK, no problem. You could put garlic in there if you so wish, but we aren't today. OK. And seasoning. Have you seasoned it? No, I haven't done anything yet. I'm going to do it to the end. That's all right. All right. All right, this goes in here. All right. Oh, this is good. Now, I spotted you around at a few festivals this ta this year as well. You've been, you've been yeah. out and about doing the festival stuff. Yeah. You because... must enjoy all that sort of stuff. It's good, though, um, I do enjoy it. Yes, I do. I do enjoy it. Um, yeah, I had a great time up in Bolton. Bolton? See, I... Uh, Bolton Food Festival. You been? No. The biggest food festival in the world. That's yeah, I is. didn't realise it's quite what it is. Yeah? Yeah, and it was really good. It's right. Right. So Go I've on. got four of these ready. Yeah. Um, I'm nearly there. We're there. I'm so nearly there. Oh, these. I did say finely chop your hair. That'll do. Fine. <laughs> there you go. We mix this in. This is all right. This is going to be quite nice. I know, you've surprised me with it, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. It does look like... I don't mean to be rude, but it looks like you've left something in the fryer yeah. and you've gone back exactly to the fryer that. in about a day's exactly time. Exactly that. So, it, because of a halibut, that halibut isn't particularly thick, which is good for this process, um, it doesn't take a lot of cooking. And bear in mind that when you take it out of the fryer, it's still continuously cooking. I've made a mess of your fryer, mind you. But, hey, look. That's all right. I was going to redo these chips, but they're going to go black, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> Leave it. <laughs> right. Now, then. Okay. I, I know you took the mic at the beginning. This is technically fish and chips, isn't it, really? Well, if you think it's fish and chips, that just shows you how you, you aren't for real, really. Because, to me, that doesn't... Yeah. No, it's not. It's a very sophisticated French dish. So, if you're just waking up, this is actually <laughs> supposed to look like this. <laughs> a few chips. Yeah. 
This is the type of stuff... You know, you know you've done a barbecue, your last barbecue of the season, <laughs> and then next year you open up your barbecue lid. <laughs> yeah, that's the idea of it. That, that looks like something yeah, that was that attached to it. that is the idea of it. You aren't getting the point, are you? The point is, it's supposed to be like that. Right. All right? Like so. You can put a few herbs on if you want to do it, but I think that's all right. Do you want to put a few herbs on it? No, I'm going to put some chilli on it. A little bit of fresh chilli on it? Yeah, on top of it. But I'm telling you, the batter will be as crisp as crisp. Yeah. The halibut will be beautifully white in the middle of it. Yeah. Just cooked. But that, to me, is charcoal-battered halibut, proper tartar sauce, fine chips. I'd be happy with that. Go on, Blackest, isn't everybody? <laughs> <laughs>
This is mugwort, right? right? So what I'm doing today is doing something that's really cheap and you never really think that you could have actually made it at home so easily and right. so quickly. Now, you need a lot of uh, dregs of red wine, which are probably not that common around in these parts, okay. are they? <laughs> right. Yeah, so a <laughs> little bit of red wine. Right, and, and then yeah. we've got some uh, over there. We have which wormwood. Yes, which is dying a death. So what, what is, where, where do you find this then? Is this woodland or what? Right, I've had that in my garden. So right. I've planted it in there, it's dying a bit, but black flies coming off it, so it'd be right. Right. <laughs> OK. <laughs> <laughs> you get it over at Dalton's neck of wood, actually. Really? I, I, I think I have seen it, but I would okay. never have known that. And what, right. do you do, what do you do with it? So that's not very pleasant to taste. Yeah, that's do even worse. It? All right, so what we're doing here yeah. is we're making vermouth. And what you do is you dry out your wormwood, you dry out your mugwort, you dry out some of your fennel heads that we've got here, OK? Put them in with a little bit of cardamom, put a little bit of a cinnamon, dry it all out, boil it up in 100 mils of wine. That is it. Let it infuse overnight. Then what you do is you top it up with all your other red wine, and the thing is to do with this one is to do fortified sherry. That will give your alcohol content a little bit of a zing and keep it going. And, and literally, that's all the move is. With this one, I've used more fennel, but I did a sugar syrup. So it was your white wine, yeah? So it was your white wine, did the same thing with the herbs, put a few little bits of different things in, like with the ginger and the fennel, and you can really make it up as long as you've got the wormwood and the mugwort, and that mugwort is incredibly common. All right? Right. OK, so we do that, and then you won't actually believe, really, how nice all this stuff is. Right, you're having cherries whether you like them or not. Are really. you having one? Me? Oh, I've had plenty, me. <laughs> right. Right. OK, so you want to pass that over? Where did you... I mean, we talked about your love of foraging as well, but, but last night you told us... I didn't realise you you, you, you... you got a law degree. Thanks. Jim. Yeah, I did um, law and politics, um, not that far from where uh, Galton is, at UEA. And then you ended up... This is amazing. You ended up being a helicopter engineer, didn't you? I did, yeah. So, well, well I, I, you know, I did that first, you know, yeah. so... Come on, then. Tell me what else like. That's quite nice. Actually, yeah, that's quite nice. Yeah, and you get that long thing. So the point what I want to make is, is that even if things don't always taste nice, it's what you do with mm. them and how to turn them into something that's absolutely fantastic. Can I fantastic. use a bit of this? Of course you can. Like the charcoal, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. And the good thing is as well, pop plenty of citrus fruits in, so you can have. Well, I'm listening. I've just got to yeah. flame this because I don't. It's it's quite strong. <laughs> Go on, go rid of it. It's fine. Go on. All right. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Next. Smell nice. So we've got plenty of citrus fruits in here and you can tailor it as long as you use. The key thing is white wine or red wine. Fortify it with either a white sherry or a red sherry and that's what will keep it. Now, you don't have to use the fortified wine. If you want, you could just make up like a stock syrup and do about 100 mils of that. Put your white wine in and you're going to get the same effect. And then that'll last for a month with the stock syrup. That will last forever. Because you know that stuff? I did some apples last year in, like, lots and lots of vodka. Yeah. All right, so what I did was I had all the juice from them, so I bunged that in as well. So, basically... Right. OK, so that's that one. Yeah. So, where are we going next, then? I'm going to move that to one side. What, what about... What about... Well, that's that stuff. Yeah. We've talked about this one. We've got this one infusing in. Right. Now, this is... Th I love this, because we use this a lot in the restaurant. I'm pretty sure you guys must use this yeah. as well, as well. This yeah, is, very sparing. I mean, this is... It's quite strong, but it is beautiful, isn't it? It is, and if you notice, like, some of it's got seed pods and then some of it's got yellow, like, seed head. So this is the bit where you pay a fortune for yeah. it. Fennel pollen. Fennel pollen in those yeah. teeny-weeny, like, caviar tins, yeah. right? And, and it costs a lot of money, but... Really, you can just go and pick it. The weirdest thing is, is that this stuff tends to grow not only just on the roadside, but like those little, like, telecom junction boxes. I don't know why it is. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> okay. All right? You know when you get the engineers, uh, yeah. right, and they're sitting there, like, doing... It's always sitting behind it. Right. Always, honestly, it doesn't matter where you are, it's always sitting behind it. OK. I, I guarantee I've taken pictures... And has this got seasonals, as, a season as well? Does it come and go, or is it that... This is well, the this one is, well, this is bond fennel, and you know when it's wild because we've got some lovely fennel down there which has got that bulb on it. This one, yeah. Yeah. This stuff just has a root. OK? So you don't get the bulb. This has just got a root. That's why... And it's usually, like, all different colours as well. So we call it bronze fennel. But at this time of year, you see, it's like that plant, isn't it? You know, they go through, you know, it comes out and you've got those little fresh fronds in spring. They're absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Everything's luscious and green. Then it goes through its seasons and then it gets to this time of year. But we can still use it because yeah. it's got these fantastic fennel heads on. You can take those, take the seeds, keep the yeah. seeds, 
grind them down your powder, put them in your curries, do whatever you need to do with it, or you can take the fennel pollen and do it with your nice fish dishes. And do, just put, use it as... But you said it, I mean, it's quite... You have to use it quite sparingly. Yeah, because I think, I think I'm right in saying that as that goes through the year and gets older and dries out more, yeah. the flavour is more powerful when it Huge. dries out. Oh, it will proper stink in my car out on yeah. way down. Honestly, it was really, you know, it was... It's a completely different... <laughs> yeah, it's a completely different flavour to when you have the young stuff in the springtime. Yes. As it is to... Yeah, it's, we... it's fragrant and light yeah. and delicate. This yeah. time of year, you know, it's packing a punch. Yeah. But it's a really nice thing. It's a really nice thing to you. And it's very common and it's very easy to see. And you're not going to get it confused with anything. Yeah. Tend to be, if you've got anything with, like, um, what these yellow umbellifers on, because you get a lot of wild parsnips around what at this time of year. Yellow... Umbellifer. Because right. like, it's like an umbrella. Umbrella. Right? Okay. It's an umbrella, so we call it an umbellifer. Right. But a lot of things with yellow umbellifers on are pretty good to go to. You know, if you're going to try out mm. foraging, because we've got, like, lots of wild parsnips around at the moment, and they're, like, six foot tall. But you can go online and find out your local forager and then join them, and then, then you'll get an appreciation and, and yeah, understanding Yeah, th there of are so many courses that you can do these days, and there's a lot of, right, really knowledgeable people around, and it, it's always best to go on a course first. Yeah. Mm. So, Always best. Don't just wing it. No, exactly. Don't just sort of like like what I've just done here with a little bit of fish. But look, we've got the grilled fish. Yeah. We've got a nice little bit of the oh, sauce that I've made with some that. of this beautiful stuff that you brought with us. That actually doesn't look bad, does it? <laughs> it doesn't look all right, does it? It looks all right. <laughs> with a nice little bit of fennel. So, I mean, I love fennel. I don't know about you guys, I but I absolutely yeah. I like love it. Fennel. It can be very, very strong. But the fennel, really, what I've done with this is you take the fennel and you thinly slice it and you just put it in ice and it crisps up really, really well. Yeah. Hey, you know what and all, don't you? Your fish didn't stick. Fish didn't stick, exactly. <laughs> a fish didn't stick and I've got my fennel salad. But there we have it. Alicia Vasey, everybody. Oh, thank you. Wonderful. we have. Bon Appetit. Have a little taste of that one, guys. Totally. Go on then, dive in. There's only one fork. What, <laughs> tell, <laughs> tell me what you think. Well, looks lovely. So that's using your little sort of homemade vermouth, really. That's... Oh, my God, it's so good. It's mm. really nice. Little bit. So all I did was make it... Just put a little bit of that vermouth in there. I put some nice little homemade fish stock in there, touch of cream, a little bit of butter, that's so salt good. and pepper. Tasty, very tasty. Mm. Superb, isn't it? Just having just the simple grill fish, nice little bit of fennel. So you got fennel all the way through it, really. We're not too strong. I think, like the ke say, the keeper the secret of that is don't, don't use too much of it. <laughs> there you go. Alicia Vasey, everybody. Yeah. Six star. Right, Romy will be cooking for us shortly, and I'll be serving up a little chicken Kiev for my guest, Alfie Bo, a little bit later. But I'll be back after the break from Mass Class in Tartatan, the best dessert that I love to make. Mm. I'll see you in a bit. Welcome back. Now I'll be treating Alfie Bo to a delicious chicken Kiev very shortly. And Chef Rumi Gill will be taking over the kitchen duties. That's coming up next. But first, it's time for this week's masterclass. I love doing these. And today I'm going to show you a recipe that makes use of the incredible apples that you'll find all over this country at this time of the year. This is probably one of the most ultimate desserts. It's a classic tart tan. I put this on a pedestal with sort of lemon tart has probably been the best desserts I think you can possibly make if you make them right. And it takes time to get this right and it produces an amazing amazing tart if you use the right apples. So for this one, I'm going to go for a standard apple that has been around for about 30 years, these. Uh, these are pink ladies. You can find these in the supermarkets, easy to get hold of. Quite interesting with these, they're sort of the first apples to blossom and the last to be harvested. So they last a long time on the tree, but what they produce is this amazing flavoured apple. But most importantly for the tart's tan is they don't break up while you're cooking. So it starts off with basically just a few ingredients. We've got butter, sugar, apples and puff pastry. I'll get onto that in a minute. But first of all, we're going to get onto our butter and our sugar. Now, for this, it's always double the amount of sugar per butter. Now, there's different methods of how to make tart's tans. There are different recipes. This is probably my favourite. I think this one, the way of doing it. I learnt this when I was working a, in a three-star Michelin restaurant when I was a young kid, and I've vowed to do this ever since. And I absolutely love it. And I've made millions of these over my <laughs> lifetime. And we start off with butter in the pan. And you can see it uses a decent amount of butter. And we throw in the sugar. So double the quantity 
of sugar to butter. Now, so we've got these beautiful apples over here, and then what I'm going to do is just take these and probably peel a few of them. Now, what you need is eight apples for this. Even though I'm producing a tat tan this sort of size, so it's roughly two apples per portion. Sometimes two and a half apples per portion, because you can see that's going to serve about four people, but you'd be surprised how many apples go into here. So I've just peeled some beforehand, just put them in a little bit of lemon water, stop them going brown. These are not too bad, actually, to be honest with you. And then I'm just going to core them. Now, it's entirely up to you whether you leave the apples whole or whether you cut these in half. I would sort of refrain from cutting them into quarters because it becomes quite difficult to work with and they soften up quite quickly if they're quarters. So you want them either in half or whole like this. So take the corer and we'll probably do another couple of apples in here and get them going. Now, you can see in the pan over here, what we're starting with is this butter and sugar mixture. Now, what you want to do is make sure the temperature's even. So when you get to this stage, just allow it to gently, gently cook. Now, eventually, this will turn into sort of fudge. And then we can add our apples into our pan. These sit in here, like that. Now, some chefs will add a little bit of water to this. Others will caramelise the sugar beforehand, add water and butter. But like I was saying, I've been doing this recipe for years and years and years, and I find, you know, this was in a really fancy restaurant when I was working as a young kid, and I sort of kept this sort of method ever since. I think it really works a treat. It's a little bit more work, but a bit like I was saying earlier, the lemon tart it produces an amazing thing. Once you get a recipe and it works, it's absolutely delicious. So what you want to do is just... Get this ticking over. Now, I do thousands of these in the restaurants, and usually I've got about six pans going on here. You're probably seeing it. I put it on Instagram a few times, and I'm just going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, get to the end, I'm going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. I'm doing this for about an hour, um, and all the chefs just clear out the way, and I'm going up and down the stove, producing about... I've probably got about 150 apples on one go at the same time. So you really got to concentrate on this. This is when, when you're making this, you need to make sure nobody phones you up, Go to the loo beforehand. Probably too much information, but literally, do, do not move from this pan. Stay here. And you just take these, and every sort of two or three minutes, you want to roll these over. So you take a spoon. It's better to use a spoon than... You're no good using a, a fork, because you're just going to break the apples. Now, I said you need about eight apples for this. If I just take, literally, eight apples, put them in here, that's how many apples we're going to use for this size tart to tan. Because after about half an hour of these cooking, you keep rolling them and rolling them, we end up with this. Look at the difference. That, that's eight apples. That's eight apples. So you can see the amount of apples that you use. And it's important, really, I think, this serves four people, to kind of make them smaller and do more if you want to, rather than try and do a massive great one, which is really, really difficult to then make and turn out. But you can see already, as you're doing this, you get this sort of fudge texture. And over a period of about half an hour, if you're rolling them around, it will eventually get to that. That's what we're looking for. And I'll leave those ticking away while we do the rest of it so you can see what they're like. You keep your eye on them, just allow them to tick away. And if they do start to catch, I'll show you what to do. But just really keep your eye on them. So, after about half an hour, allow these to cool. Now, you can cut them in half and you can decorate them slightly smaller. You can choose whichever dish you want to do it in. You can do it in a little dish like this, you can do it in a little pan, but try and keep it as small as possible. You can do individual ones if you want. You can take the apples, put them in sort of Yorkshire pudding tins, these ones, just individual, top them with pastry, exactly the same way. But either way, try and keep it small rather than do a massive one, which is really difficult. Then we take some rough puff pastry, or puff pastry, and because I do plenty of these from the restaurant, I grab some of this from the restaurant as well. This is what we use. This is, this is the French version of your ready-roll puff pastry. This is what we use in the restaurant, because this stuff is amazing. It's exactly like you buy from the supermarket, really. It's just the massive um, version of it, really. But you can tell this is made out of all butter, and that's what you want with puff pastry. Puff pastry is made with butter laminated together with pastry. As it cooks, the butter melts, creates steam, and it puffs up. That's what we're looking for. Really good quality, that's what we want. So, that, just checking out that one. Then what we want to do is just take a little bit of our pastry. I'll take a touch. 
We'll then pop that back in the fridge, because this is going to go back to the restaurant tonight. There we go. And then we can turn our attention to our tarts tan over here. Now, roughly, you can measure this, and you want about a centimetre all the way around. You can be quite rough with it. You don't have to be absolutely perfect, but just about a centimetre all the way around, like that. Then what we do is use a little knife, create some air holes in there, because there's a lot of steam that's going to happen in here to cook the underside of the pastry. We then open up the little air holes. No good with a fork, so they just close up while they cook. So then what we do is, is we take our pastry. Now, you've got to think of this. As it's sort of... Maybe a little bit too big, that. As it sort of cooks, you want the pastry to sort of expand a little bit, but you want it to create a, a sort of framework underneath. So when you turn it out, it obviously sits in that caramel. If I just cooked it with the pastry on that, as I turn it out, the apples and stuff are going to go everywhere. So what you do is you take the pastry and you tuck it in between the dish and the apples. So you can see what I'm doing there. I'm just, it sort of sits in the caramel at the bottom. I've taken a little bit of this caramel, that sits in the bottom of there, with the apples. So you cook the apples, you use some of the leftover sauce from this, that sits in the bottom of the, the dish. And then what you can do is you can pop it in the, in the fridge. This will last for two days in the fridge, if you want, and you can cook these. I was going to say cook them to order, which is what we do. But you can just cook these whenever you want. 25, 30 minutes. The bigger the, they are, the longer they're going to take to cook. But give or take half an hour in a conventional fan oven. About 180 degrees to cook the pastry. When you cook it, try and do it over one of these trays. Now, so many people will cook it like this. As the caramel bubbles up, it kind of sticks the dish to the tray and it makes a mess of the dish, makes a mess of the tray, bit of a nightmare. So you use a little baking cooling rack like that. And as it cooks, the caramel drips underneath. And that way, you just get a nice clean dish at the end of it. it. Messes up your tray, but it stops you messing up the bottom of the oven as well. But either way, a tray underneath like this. Pop it in the oven, 180 degrees, like I said, for about half an hour. And then I've got one that's in the oven. So we're going to take this out. And you see these, we'll lift this out like that. And you end up with this amazing tats tan. Now, the crucial bit is, is you leave it at this point. While we leave it at this point, we're going to go back to our apples because if we turn this out too early, the caramel goes really, really liquid and the tendency is it can, it can really burn your hands if you're not careful. So you just leave that just to set nicely and it just sets the apples. As the apples cook, they kind of souffle up at the same time. So what you want to do is just set the apples slightly like that. And you can see already on here the apples. If they start to catch like this, don't worry, you can move the middle one out to the edge, you swap them around a bit, but gradually, 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 I'll turn this up a bit so you can see what's happening. You get this sort of, you can see already, look, you're getting this amazing sort of fudge-like texture with the butter and the sugar. It's, I often think, the, you know, these desserts like a lemon tart, you, you've got to go through a process, really, to get it right. People think lemon tart is so easy. I'll be honest with you, I've been a pastry chef for 30 odd years. I think the lemon tart is probably the most difficult dessert anybody could ever make, because to make it right is really quite technical. It's the right amount of filling, it's got to taste nice, it shouldn't split, the pastry wants to be nice and thin. It's really quite a tricky one to get right, and I think tart tan is one of those things. People make it and make a mess of it and never want to do it again, but it's all about getting the right apples, the right pastry, doing it the right way, taking your time for this, and it will work. So you've got your nice little bit of tart tan like this, and then it's a simple matter of turning it out. You can turn it out in several different ways. You can turn it out on a cooling rack. You can pop it straight onto a plate and tie it to you. I kind of do it on a cooling rack, really. So you can do this several ways. You can put your cooling rack like that on it. Then you can put your tray like this. And then you hold the handles, the tray, and then it's just a matter of turning it over very quickly. Straight over. Like that. And then we just leave it in the dish. We'll just leave it like that. These ones, you can do a similar sort of thing. Do that. So, again, I always try and use a cooling rack, really, because you've, you've spent a lot of time with the pastry, and the pastry wants to be sort of the, the shell. And if you don't, and you do this and put it onto the tray, all that lovely juice, and it is amazing, just makes the pastry go soggy. So you really want to make sure that... I mean, if you didn't want to do this, you can get a... Try and get a... Yeah, one of these. 
little palette knife like that, you can do a similar sort of thing. So you can do this quite quickly over onto a tray. Just be quite confident with it. Once you start, just straight over. All right? So you can see now the apples, just to back over here, because we're just going to leave that for a second before the big reveal. But you see, look, the apples start to change colour. They start to change texture, change size. They almost go half the size of what you put in. And if you keep doing this and rolling them around, eventually, with the bubbles like that, it will turn that beautiful caramel. So then, when you take it to the table and you lift it off... <laughs> it's like some famous advert then, that was... The... <laughs> but look, you just lift these off. And this one over here, you can see, with this one, all I've done is take the halves of the... So I've cooked the apples exactly how we've got it, here. And all I've done is cook the apples and I've cut them in half and we end up with this style tart tan. So then when we lift it off, this one... So this would be for two, or one, depending on where you live. But that would be your classic tart tan. You can serve that with clotted cream, whatever you want. It's entirely up to you, a little bit of pouring cream. But either way, that is one of the most famous desserts in the world. If you get it right, definitely one of the most rewarding, a classic tat tan. There you have it, done. <laughs> now, if there's anything you'd like to learn about in a little mask class, I'd love doing these. Uh, do get in touch with see if we can help out right here on the show. That was for Will, our director, by the way, because he messed it up quite a lot, apparently. Uh, time for a quick break now, but join us again in a couple of minutes when Chef Romy Gill will be here with an amazing recipe for sea bass. I'll see you in a minute. Don't leave the apples. Do not leave the apples. Welcome back. Now, I'll, coming up, I'll be putting a new spin on a classic chicken Kiev, or chicken Kiev, for my guest Alfie Bo, very surely. But first, I'm here with Galton, and we're going to get ready to enjoy a dish from a woman whose personality lights up the kitchen everywhere she goes. It's the fabulous Romy Gill. <laughs> Wonderful to have you on. What are you going to be doing then? A beautiful bit of sea bass. Oh, I'm so excited to make this specially gotten. Uh, this is the first time I'm going to feed you, right? Yeah. James and I have cooked yeah. so many times. Absolutely. James will tell you I'm quite bossy. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, the Cornish sea bass is amazing. It's yeah. a beautiful fish. So what ha I may I've created a spice blend here, which has got the cumin, some uh, black peppercorns, turmeric, ginger powder, chilli, yeah. and then coriander seeds and bay leaves. We'll blend that into the spice blend. So I'm chopping up the celeriac over here. Yes. This is for a little sort of puree to go with it. Like yes, it's a beautiful... You know when it... The celeriac has that earthy, that mm -hmm. warmth to it. When it goes with the cumin, the fennel, it just brings out the beautiful... I absolutely flavor. adore celeriac. I don't know about Do you. you? But I think it's absolutely amazing. But you've pureed, fried... I absolutely love it. Soup, Soup, raw, it's brilliant. I love it. So those spice mixes got in there. What have you got in here? All the different sort of spices in there. Once you blend it, would it last very long? Or is... Yeah, it does last because if you keep in an airtight container, it lasts you for a month because you need that beautiful warmth of flavours that comes out all the spices, the earthiness. So I've grated some garlic in it and then some lemon juice. I'll put some lemon juice as well. And then also... So, growing that's... up in India, whereabouts did you grow, grow up in, really? With North, South, East or West? They've got... So, I grew up in West Bengal. To confuse you more, it's East this India. Is... <laughs> <laughs> so, that's e this West Bengal, but East India? Yes. OK. So, I grew up there. My dad worked in a steel plant there, so I grew up there. Um, and... Um... But all the people came from different parts of India. You know, India is such a big country. India is not a small country. We speak different languages, we cook differently, we have different rituals. But also the regions. You've got so many, there's like 50 odd region food regions. I mean, there's tons so of So many regions. different. We, every household cooks differently. Your dialects changes everywhere you go. So I've just put some rapeseed oil in there. You can use yeah. any oil if you want. So to. Where, where are your base? Is it, is it vegetarian or is it still... I mean, there's a huge vegetarian influence throughout the whole of India, but... but... So, um, Bengal is very much fish place, you know? Right, it's very okay. much... But my parents are from North India, we're Punjab. Yeah. So I'm just going to put some slips in there. Um, so, yes, my parents are from Punjab, and but uh, I grew up in West Bengal, so food is so different. So in a Punjabi house, household, people eat mostly vegetarian food, more lentils, more vegetables. So all that kind of thing people have more in their kitchens. You right, know? so we've got some oil on here. What are the spices that you're going to 
sprinkle so, on the top of there. So the cumin, ground cumin, cumin seeds, peppercorns, and then um, fennel. I think fennel, cumin are mad match made in heaven with, with celeriac. It works really, right. really well. So this spice blend, which I just mix it together, it's going to go all in inside. Nice. Don't love, worry love to... This. Yeah, I do. With your thing, you have to properly cook the fish. You know, otherwise, if you don't marinate the fish properly, it doesn't work. I think it's really, really important. And how, how soon before you actually cook it? How long would you give that marinade? I think I, I do it usually for one hour because I just think that the juices go yeah. in, the marination goes yeah. in, so the flavour goes in, the taste and the texture changes when you're marinating it. So you're going to blend, so you blend the celery and you add, you add cream and milk to this? Yes. If people are, uh, want to make the puree at home and they are plant-based, they can use like a coconut milk mm. or something like that, right. oat, mm. oat milk as well, almond milk, anything they want to. So that's marinated. I'm just going to wash my hands quickly. So we just blend it? Yes. So it's nice and smooth? It's nice and smooth, yes. It's nice and creamy. And then this machine doesn't take very long? Yes. And then it goes on the tray. That one. And we end up with this that we've got in here. So you want me to just warm this up? I'll warm this up slightly. Please, yes. So we'll put that one on there and that one on there. That's going to go in the oven now. Yeah. I'm just going to pour a little bit more oil on the top. That'll give me some olive oil. Do you want olive oil or you want the rapeseed oil? Rapeseed oil. Is okay. Fine. Because I think mustard, rapeseed oil. Yeah. Yeah. Not but olive oil. Alternatively, you can put that in the fridge because that's perfect for dinner later. Yes. <laughs> In there, and we've got one in here. So this is just warming up. Tell us what you're doing. I'll yeah. warm that up for you. Tell so us you... about this bit, because this is the next one. So I've warmed this up for you, and I'll leave that just ticking over, over at the back. So that's the puree. Yes, I'm going to do the dressing now. First, I'm going to chop some. Can I use your knife? I is can chop okay? it. Oh, you can. Oh, yeah. brilliant! You can do what that. What do you want? Please. It roughly chopped, finely yes, chopped. Yes, anything. So ghee. I think ghee is so nice with the dressing. Yeah. If you don't have the ghee, you can use. You can use brown butter, you can use butter, you can use oil, but I think ghee is such a magic ingredient. So that goes in there. There you go. Thank you want to turn it up a bit? Yes, please. There you and go. then I'm going to use that tamarind. Now tell us about tamarind then, because when you when you're buying it, you can get it in several different ways, and particularly in Oriental supermarkets, you buy it. Sometimes it's in the pods, and you've got to soak it in hot water. Puree is probably the best for people, don't you think? Yes, and also chutney is the one thing which has the sweetness, the sourness you can use for, like when you're doing a barbecue, you can use for curries, you can use for different things. I just think tamarind is one of those beautiful root fruit, which is such an important part of Indian cuisine. Um, so I think we're going to... It kind of looks like uh, it's a big bean, like a... Yeah. Like a Brown bean, yes. like a broad bean pod. And then you have pods in it, yeah. Yeah, like a broad bean pod you look at as well. But that's that's the that's the chutney that you're using as well here. Yes. So that's not the raw tamarind. No, you can use the raw tamarind and sometimes people don't know what to do with the you know when you get like a tamarind paste and tamarind blended, but mm -hmm. it's so so easy to make your own. You can add so many different spices, mm -hmm. you can add chili. I remember you saying you you love the heat, but you can't eat too much heat. So if you have the paste, you can actually use how much spices you want to. You don't have to put too many of it. And tell me, <laughs> this is a really ignorant question. Ask me, ask me, please. Ghee. Ghee, Is yeah. that so just melted butter? No, it's not. Right. So this actually, lot of but uh, ghee that you get in this country is clarified butter mm -hmm. and is sold as ghee. But the ghee actually in India, because what we do, so the milk is, uh, you know the cream that you come mm -hmm. on the top of the silk? Yeah. You'll keep that cream and the white cream that they make is actually then they'll boil it and, and then the, make the butter from that. Okay. So ghee but, but is very, a lot of very, it's fermented very... as well. It's, it's a real art to getting it right. A friend of it mine is. does it and it's not, it is. it's not... We just think it's clarified butter yeah. used for hollandaise and stuff like that. It's not... This, it's, no. Yeah, it's a real art to it. There's a whole whole process of making a ghee. Yeah. So you know there are there's not just one thing that you put a um, butter in a in, in a pan and you melt it and make yes a clarified butter. That's not get you know that's not it. It's very very different. So James, the fish is done, right? Look at this. Oh, look at that. How Isn't that is amazing? That? And I like the fins and everything in it. I don't like taking it off. But a lot of people would trim that off as well, but you just like to leave it as it is. Yeah. Mm, yeah. So what have you done here with this? You've just taken the ghee with the garlic. 
with the garlic. So can you do the smell? It's so lush. And then the then you have the tamarind in, in it it's and a little bit of water. I'm thinking that we got the tools to lift it off. That's what I'm thinking. You're, you're just you're just cracking on. I'm going. What am I going to lift this off with? Um, oh, that good luck. Knife and bits of long knife. There you go. Right. If I give you get you to uh, get the. There we go. Lift this up like that, and then I'm going to pop this underneath, hopefully like this, and the camera will turn around and. Take a shot of a butterfly in the garden while I'm doing this. Yeah. <laughs> but can you just lift off the tray? Thank you, Paul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got well that. Done. Look well at that. You did it, James. Well We've done. Got there. Look at that. I'll take a little bit of this liquor because you you want some of them. Pour that over the top. Yes. So that that's your lovely, and this is a lovely sauce that goes with it. And we've got the puree there. I know you want to put that into a little bowl. That we've got on the in the pan there. That's nice and hot. I mean, this just looks amazing. <laughs> your food, I remember I, I, every time you come, your food is so, so tasty. Do you miss the restaurant business? Is that. I do, you miss? But, but, but you know, I do a lot of um, guest chef events. So yeah. I really don't miss the stress of not having the staff. Yeah. So I don't miss that, but yeah. I love doing guest chef events, mm. which again, you know, people do understand that I do cook. My first love is chefing, is yeah. what I love cooking. And then writing books and demos come later. So I can't wait for you guys to taste <laughs> Well, this. I say, if you're at one of Romy's chef events and you're looking to sit at the table, you get to taste this. So give us the name of this dish. Just spicy tamarind fish. <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> Romy, everybody. <laughs> I love this style of cooking as well. You just dive in. Yeah. Go on. Go on, go on, then. I mean, you love bass like I do. I don't love you go bass. This is my favourite. But this and with... when you see that, look at it. Brilliant. Just taste it with this puree. Yeah. See, that, that, that tamarind at the end, it... it's, it's amazing, so isn't good. it? So just good. give you that sweetness and so sharp. Good. So good. And that puree is so perfect with that. You're good at this, aren't you? I thought I'd do something different. That. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that puree is absolutely delicious. This would work with anything, though, mm -hmm. isn't it? It's just absolutely glorious. There we go. Romy, everybody! <laughs> there we go. Right, we've still got time for one more final course, so join us again after the break when I'm going to rustle little amazing chicken kiev or chicken kiev for my guest, Alfie Bell. See you after the break. That is delicious. It is. You've nearly eaten half of it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, sadly, to the last part of the show. Oh. But I'm here with all my guests, Alicia Vasey, Gordon Blackerson, Romy Gill, and, of course, Alfie Bow. Yeah. Hey! Ooh, there, there yeah. we go. And for my final dish, I thought you should have to make an enduya, uh, chicken Kiev, or Kiev. Chicken Kiev, as a, a lot of people call it as well. So, enduya is quite an interesting thing. It comes from Calabria, mm -hmm. uh, from uh, Italy, and I thought I'd do this wonderful little garlic butter, because I know that you love all these things. You love chicken, chicken Kiev or chicken Kiev, but I know you love your cabbage and your carbonara and the peas and all that, because yeah, it's all your favourite sort of... Thank you very much. That's all right. I was always thinking. I feel spoiled. Yeah, and we're going to do a, a nice little bit of garlic butter with this uh, nenduya. So first of all, we'll take a, a touch of parsley, which I've got in here, and why don't we... We'll chop the whole thing up. There we go. And you're going to blend it mm -hmm. with some of this garlic. Now, the garlic, what you do with the garlic is you roast it. So you just take the garlic like this, you take the tops off, nice and simple, like that, into the tin foil, a little bit of olive oil over the top, and then roast it in the oven. Ooh. And roast it in the oven for a good 30 to 40 minutes. Just chuck it in the oven like that. It's lovely. And that produces this amazing cooked garlic. Now, this is all for this chicken, which I'm going to get on and fry mine. Now, my fryer's not big enough. I know there's three of you, sadly, but I can only fit two in the fryer, so you'll have to share. So we're going to take our chicken like that, and I'll, get, I'll show you this stage that we're going to get to, but they're going to fry. In the oil, it's about 160 degrees. The important thing is not to have it too hot. Hey, Gordon? Yeah. So you don't want to colour the chicken. 
before the chicken's cooked, if that makes sense. And then we got this nanduya. Galt will explain where, what nanduya is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so sure. <laughs> that hasn't hit Norfolk yet. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. Did you all know what this was? I thought it was spam. <laughs> <laughs> then do you? It's a spicy sausage. Comes from Calabria. It's got fennel seed. It's got pork. It's got paprika. It's amazing. Absolutely, be absolutely beautiful. And then what we're going to do is add that to the mixture into there, and then we're going to add a little bit of butter to this to make a nice little bit of garlic butter. You did take the rind off it, didn't yes, you? Yes, I took the rind off it. Don't you worry. Uh, and then I'm going to leave you to it. All... Yeah, lead me to it. You I'm get leave on you to it. Your, Meanwhile, you're over here, we're going to take our checks into a chicken Kiev over here, or Kiev. We've got in here. Now, it's important when you're taking this, the chicken, is to buy it with the fillet on, because a lot of the time you buy this from the supermarket, and they sell that as extra, like, for stir-fries and mm. stuff like that. To take it off, but we're going to buy it with the skin on and the little fillet on, and we're just going to take this off, and I'm going to make a little hole in it and use that to stop the butter from coming out at the end. But we're going to talk about everything that you're doing at the moment, because you've just finished your tour. Those people who are just yes. waking up, just finished your tour. You've got a new album out. I've got a brand new album out. It's Ready called, for Christmas. It's called Open Arms. Yeah. A symphonic songbook. It's a collection of classic rock songs um, set with a, a wonderful band, my own band, and a symphonic orchestra. Well, I, I came to see you at the Albert Hall years ago, and I remember you performing this and as well, because you, you, love, you love that kind of era and that genre, but yeah. also... Was, before you started singing, wasn't when the drums were the big thing for I, you? Yeah, it? I was a drummer. I used to play in all the working men's clubs in Blackpool and things. You know, Loved the, that. Yeah, backing all the singers. It was a lot of fun. And in local bands as well, but yeah, drumming was my first sort of musical love, I, yeah. I would say. But then I got into the singing side. What about music for you, you guys? No, 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 no instrument, no. No, I can't play anything. I can sing a bit, Indian songs. Really? Yeah. Go on then. No, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I can cook. But... What about you, Alicia? No? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll do karaoke with you. Yeah. yeah? Yeah, I can sing. I can sing four good words before I go off tune. Really? Is it? Yeah. Galton? Yeah. I'm quite good. <laughs> <laughs> good at what? Singing. <laughs> good at singing. Karaoke. <laughs> As you put that, that endure in one lump, it doesn't all go round. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> So I've made this look really difficult because it's <laughs> one lump of it. Galton, you make everything look really <laughs> difficult. But, <laughs> right, we're going to take our chicken. This is our little nugget of, of, of butter, and we pop that into the little pocket. Right. And when you take the, the butter, you can just pop it straight in there, like that, and it sits right inside your chicken. And then you use the little bit of chicken that we've got over here to act as a little plug that goes inside here as well. Yeah, that's good. So, so then you go, that goes in there, and it's this little plug that sits inside there as well. It's very clever. Like, well, it's, 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 it, this has been done for years and years. What do you believe? This was, I think this was the first ready-made meal right, right. in the UK. Back when we were just born. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but in, I think in the 70s, it was the first ready-made meal, I think. It was an exotic it, thing, wasn't it? Wasn't yeah, it? well, it, it was the first thing that people could buy already ready-made, yeah. and it was all there ready. But you can take flour, egg and bread, which I'm going to show you what to do in a minute. Meanwhile, we're going to get Galton doing that sort of stuff over here. But you've got to take a bit of a break for them for the for, for Christmas period and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm going to take a bit of time off over Christmas and then back into it next year. Right. And, uh, what yeah, about the West End things. for you? Because you've done Broadway, you've done Vegas, you've done the West End. Does, yeah. does, does, does those, those things draw you back? Because I remember the last it, time you were here, we were talking about writing, you were actually writing a musical. Yeah, I'm you? still in the process of doing that, and it does take a while. Is it the type of thing that you... So I'm just going to show you over here, but is it... So this is double pané. It's flour, egg, flour, egg and bread crumbs. So usually when you... When class things are double pané or single pané, you take the flour and the egg, Roll it in that. If you're doing things like uh, scotch egg. Yeah. Scotch egg, that kind of stuff. Uh, little goujons, that kind of stuff. You flour, egg and breadcrumbs. Well, with chicken Kiev or Kiev, you just take it in the flour, you double pan it, and then you put it back in here again. So it creates this thicker glue. Right. So imagine every time you're doing this, it gets stickier on your hands. It creates a thicker glue, and hopefully it's going to fill that little gap in, that when right. you take the crumb, that goes over the top, you then pop that in your fridge, 
then you've got it when you need it, or you can just cook it straight away. Right, Galton, you can explain what we've got going over there. Yeah, so this is the butter, yeah. the garlic and the endure and the Nendu parsley, no, whatever it is. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Nendu, yeah? Yeah, the garlic, the butter, soft butter, parsley. Right, and, and we've got our... And then I've done a double thing of cling film. Good. Because otherwise you end up with a thick middle bit and instead of this nice thin one. Right. Well, I'm going to take this off now, because I'm going to take these out, because these are ready. Because meanwhile, I'm then going to give Galton... <laughs> the need to... size of them. <laughs> I mean... What do you mean? Honestly. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> I mean, you were worrying about giving one... Uh, not I'm not him. worrying about any. He's, um, he's morning that he's just bought... He came in here, he's bought the brand-new shirt, he's gone for a slim fit, he's going to come out here breathing in. That's what, that's what I wanted to... <laughs> I, I, I use the excuse, it's my singing muscle. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I want to feed people, that's what I want to right. do. Right, now, what do you so, want? So, Galton, I want you to deep this. fry these, if that's all right. All right. Do you keep the centre stalk in? Uh, yeah. It's entirely up to you how you do it, to be honest with you. I, I can't be bothered at this moment in time. It's entirely up to you. Yeah, all right. That's all right, that's it. So, we've got our lovely little, little hispy cabbage, which is amazing. We've that. cooked a lot on the griddle. Oof. These on the barbecue are just amazing. You can steam them whole, and then you just basically chagrin these. They're unbelievable. It's my favourite. You yeah. brush that with a very well-known yeast extract. Oh, yeah. It begins with M. Got you. Yeah. That one. That goes on there, and then you can brush it, and it tastes amazing. But I'm not going to do that with this. I'm just going to make a nice little bit of... Which he calls it a little nage. No, I didn't. I called it an emulsion. An emulsion. I call it a combination of water... That's what makes me... Classic French, you know Classic. what I'm saying? Yeah. Romy. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 Makes him a lot of things that I can't pronounce on this show. I know that, but look. That's why you're in the good food, guys. This right? is going to spit. I knew this would happen. <laughs> <laughs> you think I'm an idiot. Go on, just make sure you stir it around. Stir well, it. as if I'm going to stand over this. <laughs> <laughs> right, this is going in here. Look at it. Go, let's just do it until it stops spitting. I am doing it. <laughs> So this is our nice little emulsion, as we call it. The peas, the cabbage, the little bit of carbonara. This sort of stuff is amazing, really, carbonara. And we just chop this up. Like you said, you can fry it. <laughs> you can thinly slice it. Don't, don't make it brown. Just make sure it's... I'm just, not making it brown. Just, just, just colour it, that's all. <laughs> that's it. Now, take that. Are you bit. sure? Well, a little bit longer, maybe. So your new album's out now. So this is more interesting. <laughs> 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 And you're about to perform for us next. Tell us what you're going to be doing next as well. T tell us about the performance that you're going to do. I'm going next. to sing you uh, one of the songs off the album, which was an Aerosmith song called Don't Want to Miss a Thing. I love Ooh. this. But well, people think, you know, that song was an Aerosmith song. It was written by them, those guys, but it's actually written by Diane Warren. Oh. And it's an awesome song. It's a beautiful, beautiful track. It's a, it's a love song. And so when you hear. So was it, was it performed from a male voice? Was it written from a male voice? She wrote it and she knocked on Steve Tyler's door and said, I love this. You've got to sing this song. Listen to this song I've just written. And they, they gave in and they did it. And it was the biggest, one of the biggest hits that they ever did. <laughs> it's so, an amazing story. I'm going to sing that one for you tonight. And yeah. talking about stories as well, not only has got a great album, you've got the book out as well. You can tell there them. There you go. We Ooh. talked about it as well. You, I mean, you kindly signed it for as well. So It comes with a free packet of crayons as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it, your book is called? Um, uh, I forgot. What is it? Face the Music. <laughs> it's you. Oh, what is it called, Alfie? Face the Music, My Story. That's right. Yeah. You have this effect on people. <laughs> well, That's, me? Yes. Right. Where do you want this? Just two plates like that. And you can move that tray out the inside. Oh. Two plates. I've only got three of those. That's it. That's it. Thank you. So, wonderful. Look, we take our lovely peas. That looks amazing. Our cabbage. Like that. Wonderful. And then... That's... Oh, this is on. <laughs> <laughs> go on, go on. I cannot take you anywhere. Well, I didn't think... I thought you would have turned the... Oh. <laughs> I could really... <laughs> Can I just take that? Oh, it stresses me out, you coming on this show. Shut up. Can you... Are you not going to, um... I'm going to do the money shot. We oh. call it a money shot. We just need to pile this around it first to make it look pretty. <laughs> look at that. That's four times the amount of food that you naturally put on a plate. <laughs> that is. Yeah. That is. Right, and then the money shot. Do you want to open... You, you can do it. You can... You can open. <laughs> yeah, I'll just clean my knife. Yeah, yeah come on, don't get me anymore. <laughs> Go on, just put... When you... When you... Right, because he's got plenty of butter in. If it squirts on his shirt, it's not my problem. I'm doing it. Just that's it. Cut it, and then that's the camera. There. 
Right. So I'm going here. Yeah. <laughs> if this all comes out on me, yeah. I'll kill you. <laughs> Turn it. Ooh, look. Oh, look at that. Oh, my oh, God. Yeah, look at that. That was good. Oh, look word. at that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You've actually done that really quite well. <laughs> <laughs> look me at that. Me and Galton, everybody! <laughs> Well, bon appétit, Alfie. Thank you. There you go. Ladies. Thank you. Dive in. Dive in. Careful with your shirt. Careful okay. with your shirt. Careful with your shirt. <laughs> it's a slim oh, thick one as well. Get with your shirt. Oh, oh there we way. go. I've survived. Careful with the shirt. There you go. Nice. There you go. Oh, look at that. Incredible. Look at that. Mmm. <laughs> 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 it's sound effects. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> hey, you're going to be falling through us I in a minute. Now. Yeah. Uh, I'll, right, I'll leave you to get ready. Thank you. Off you go. There okay, you go. Bit, yeah. uh, that's it. That's all we've got time for today. A massive thank you to all my guests. They're brilliant. I told you today was going to be good. Alicia Vasey, Gordon Blackiston, Romy Gellin, of course, Alfie Bow. Woo! Woo! We'll see you same time, same place next Saturday morning. We'll be joined by more top chefs, other brilliant guests. Uh, now, playing us out with the performance of I Don't Want to Miss a Thing. It's the fabulous Alfie Bow. Brilliant. Yeah. I could stay awake just to hear you breathing Watch you smile while you are sleeping While you're far away and dreaming I could spend my life in this sweet surrender I could stay lost in this moment forever Every moment spent with you is a moment I treasure. Don't want to close my eyes. Don't want to fall asleep because I miss you, babe. And I don't want to miss a thing. Because even when I dream of you, the sweetest dream will never do. I still miss you. Babe, and I don't want to miss a thing Lying close to you Feeling your heart beating And I'm wondering what you're dreaming Wondering if it's me you're seeing Then I kiss your eyes Thank God we're together. I just want to stay with you in this moment forever, forever and ever. And I don't want to close my eyes. Don't want to fall asleep because I miss you, babe. And I don't want to miss a thing. Cause even when I dream of you. And I don't want to miss a thing